and welcome to this U Catholic webinar in conjunction with Catholic Distance University. Um, I thought we'd begin, um, since we're going to be talking about mercy again, I thought uh, we'd begin with the Canticle of Mary, the uh, Magnificat. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. The soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. So, who's ready to talk about mercy again with the professors of Catholic Distance University? I am pumped. <laughs> for tonight. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, about a month ago or so, we hosted a webinar with these same panelists on the parables of mercy that you find in the Gospels. And I was so pumped about the conversation. I said, guys, you got to do this again. And they obliged. They listened to me. It's pretty incredible. So uh, my name is Anna Mitchell. I'm the, the host and the producer of the Sunrise Morning Show, which you can hear on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network at 6 a.m. Eastern Time, bright and early, and uh, also via the Sunrise Morning Show app. If you go to sunrisemorningshow.com, you can find out details and links for that. I'd like to uh, reintroduce our panelists, If uh, well, maybe introduce if you're new to our webinar tonight. Dr. Peter Brown is the academic dean for Catholic Distance University. He has a BA from Yale and an MA in theology from Franciscan University in Steubenville, has worked with Dr. Scott Hahn and published book reviews and articles, as well as given lectures on scripture and theology. He received his doctorate in biblical studies at Catholic University of America, which includes advanced studies in Greek and all biblical languages. He teaches sacred scripture and biblical languages for CDU. Dr. Brown, good to see you. Thank you. Good to be here. Dr. Matthew Bunsen is faculty chair for Catholic Distance University and senior contributor for EWTN and a senior fellow of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. He is the author or co-author of some 50 books and was longtime editor up until this year of the Catholic Almanac from our Sunday Visitor, also serving as editor of the Catholic Answer Magazine and senior correspondent for OSV News Weekly. He teaches courses at CDU in church history, history, and Catholic social teaching. Dr. Hudson, welcome. Always good to be with you, Anne. And uh, Dr. Christine Wood is also with us. She's an instructor with Catholic Distance University, received her PhD in theology from Marquette and her MA in theology from Franciscan University of Steubenville. Since then, She's been lecturing in Systematic and Biblical Theology and Ethics at John Paul the Great Catholic University. Christine is currently working towards the publication of her doctoral dissertation entitled The Metaphysics and Intellect Intellective Psychology in the Natural Desire for Seeing God, Henri de Lubac and Neoscholasticism. I just love that title, Dr. Wood. <laughs> <laughs> she hails. <laughs> I yeah. just said. I can't wait to read it. Let's just put it that way. Dr. Wood yeah. is from uh, Australia, where she's the president of the St. John Center for Biblical Studies, and she teaches theology at CDU. Dr. Wood, it's good to see you as well. Thank you. You too. Yeah, I can't wait for the movie version of the dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> you for insomnia. Yes. <laughs> Oh man, this is going to be great. I, I just love it. So we're going to be talking about mercy in the New Testament outside of the parables of Jesus today. And for all of you tuning in right now, feel free to type in your questions. There is a little um, question bar on your dashboard that you can use, and I'll be monitoring that throughout the discussion, and I'll try to get to your questions as you're uh, bringing them forward, or at least by the end, um, we'll try to have kind of a, 
a rapid fire uh, question and answer session um, with whatever time we have left, but we have a lot to talk about tonight. So um, I wanted to start off this webinar by talking about how Jesus showed mercy. And Dr. Bunsen, I was wondering if uh, you could start us off by reflecting on the incarnation as sort of in a way his first act of mercy. Well, exactly what with the incarnation of our Lord, we have this decisive moment that when we track scripture, we go to the Old Testament and we can talk, we could do another whole webinar and we probably will be just on mercy in the Old Testament. But what we see when we when we track salvation history through the Old Testament is God's mercy, God's justice, but God's mercy all the way through history, reaching a certain culmination point of our Lord's incarnation, in which God truly incarnated mercy, in which God brought himself into the world to bring mercy in a way that the world had never seen before. But in a way, if we go back to Genesis itself, we can see Adam, we see in Christ the new Adam, bringing mercy, again justice, but mercy for the fall of Adam and the remedying of our sinful state. But at the same time, we see in the incarnation, God's incarnation as a child, and the need then for the mercy of others to survive in this new world, to rely on the Holy Family, on his mother, on his foster father, Joseph, to help him, and therefore to take upon himself humanity in, in all the dimensions that all of us experience in our lives from our birth uh, to our own death. And of course, his death came on a cross, uh, the most profound act of mercy uh, of all time that remains for us the model for mercy. And in between those years, we have Christ demonstrating mercy in such a host of different ways to the parables that we talked about last time but in that giving of himself. And that's, it's a perfect opening, I think, for an understanding of mercy in the New Testament because we have the example par excellence in Christ himself. And Dr. Wood, this, this example of mercy that we have in the incarnation, that the ultimate act, one of the ultimate acts of mercy from our Lord was something that our Blessed Mother recognized. We just prayed the canticle of Mary. That's right, yeah. Well, um, Our Lady plays a major role in salvation history and she fulfills many types of, um, of women who show mercy throughout the Old Testament. And, of course, she is the new Eve. So um, continuing on what uh, Dr. Bunsen just said about Christ being the new Adam, Mary is the new Eve. So I think it's really important also to note that mercy has to do with sin. It's related to sin. So I, I've, um, I've witnessed a number of times in this year of mercy that people talk about God, God being mercy, that God is mercy. But in fact, that's not actually quite accurate. God, God is love, but love shown towards the sinner is mercy. And so mercy is the expression of God's love towards the sinner. So sin must be taken into account when we speak about mercy. And uh, so hence, God's love expressed throughout salvation history and most fully in the incarnation is God's mercy towards us because God came in, in Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. And... Uh, our Blessed Mother proclaims that in the Magnificat. Yeah, and and Dr. Dr. Brown, Mary is the mother of mercy, is she not? The mother of mercy, yeah, that's that's an excellent way of putting it. The mother of mercy, or maybe even the mother of mercies, because God I the Father. I come up with it myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, if you had, Andy, it would have been it would have been brilliant because yeah, that's right because you know because she's the mother of our Lord, she gets to lay claim to being the mother of all that He is, and so all all, all of the, the the graces of Jesus, you know, except possibly the one that saved Mary from original sin, you know, are you know in effect flow through Mary 
to to uh, th through Jesus, of course, from Jesus through Mary. To, um, it's it's a really kind of a, a, a you know almost unfathomable mystery to ponder. Now, I want to talk about um, the miracles of Jesus in, um, well, a few of them in specific, but Dr. Wood, let's, uh, let's start with you on this one. In general, how are the miracles of Jesus, particularly his miracles of healing, a portrayal of his mercy? Well, just uh, following on from what I said earlier with regard to mercy being related to sin, we have to look at the effects of sin, and um, there are numerous effects of sin. The greatest one, of course, is being deprived of God's grace and God's friendship. But then following on from that, we have uh, wounds in our whole human nature, and they include um, an inclination towards sin in the will, a, a deprivation of, of, um, of knowledge, proper knowledge that we need to reason properly and and therefore our inability to to reason accurately all the time so we have we're prone to ignorance and error but also within our body we're, we're prone to to sickness and, and disease and so these things that Jesus comes across in people like leprosy or lameness or blindness, they're all effects of, of Adam's sin, not necessarily the, the personal sin of those individual people, but the effects of, of Adam's sin right from the very beginning. So we see Christ coming to heal us from sin in his mercy, and that includes all the effects of sin, and ultimately the greatest effect is death and hence his resurrection from the dead. So when Jesus comes, for instance, to heal, uh, to heal the man born blind in uh, John chapter 9, we see that this is an effect of sin, the blindness, because the man receives this blindness even from within the womb. He's, he's born this way. And so it's nothing personal that he's done to incur this blindness blindness. Um, but we also see a deeper uh, reality here, that it's not necessarily just pointing to the physical blindness of the man, but also the spiritual blindness that comes through sin. And we see this particularly after the miracle, where Jesus enters into this discussion or, or debate with the Pharisees about um, spiritual blindness and, and the sin of the Pharisees, who do not recognize Christ as the Messiah, but instead seek to destroy him. And uh, Dr. Brown, I want to keep it with the general questions yeah. for a minute here. Um, this, what are, what are some of the common denominators in in these stories when it comes to Jesus showing mercy to these people who are in need of physical healing? Right, right. Well, I mean, obviously, the physical healings on one level just connote a you know a, a personal concern for fellow human beings who are long suffering and you know or either have inherited conditions or you know acquired conditions that you know it's part of the human condition to do uh, to get sick or to get ill um or, or to develop medical problems and so on one level i think you know that the healing the you know the, the, the remedying of these conditions it is simply um you know something we would do from the matter of just human compassion you know a, a doctor um will will heal people um or try to heal people from physical ailments and, and you know doctors of course have been around for a long time but the whole idea of a hospital is is really in, a, in kind of the sense that we think of it is really very much a, a a catholic christian invention in some way of of having this this work of healing become a uh a, 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 you know in effect a full-time ministry or apostolate where you know we're, we're trying in effect to struggle against what Dr. Wood described as, as the, the sort of effects of, of sin and death. Um, but, but taking it sort of a step further, you know, what's kind of really interesting about the, these ailments that Jesus heals from is that they're, they're always sort of symbolic in a way of more than just what they are. Like leprosy, you know, we can have a, a sort of a physical understanding of this. It's a skin disease. Um, it effectively destroys your nerve cells at, at the end of your your, your 
your your uh, limbs so you can't feel pain anymore. But you can see on a deeper level, you know, how that can be representative of, of a certain kind of of, of a soul sickness, right? Where you, you, you're so numb from doing a particular thing or uh, rebelling against God that you can no longer feel uh, pain or shame associated with this. And, and that's a very, very real human condition. Christine mentioned blindness. You know, blindness is, of course, a physical attribute in that story. But, of course, you know, on another level, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a spiritual attribute. Um, you know, the, the man with the withered hand who Jesus heals, of course, yeah, there, there is a physical illness there. But the withered hand, you know, also symbolizes, well, it symbolizes a lot of things. It symbolizes just sin in general. But there's also a very specific sin because that withered hand story really harkens back to uh, Jeroboam who, who rebelled against um, the, the United Kingdom of David. And when he when he touched his own altar, his hand withered. And so and there's also a psalm that mentions this, too. You know, when I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. And so, you know, both of these are in some ways, you know, spiritual sins um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, rebelling against God's plan. And they symbolize the desire of Jesus to to not only restore fallen human nature, but but to but to restore the kingdom as well. What's interesting in the story of the leper, and I don't mean to, to filibuster here, but there's one thing I wanted to add about that, and we're going to probably get to that. But the idea that, that when Jesus heals the leper, he says, uh, be, be clean. Um, actually, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I, meant to th- I think I'm thinking of the, the, the withered hand where, where he says, which is greater to say that your sins are forgiven or um, take up your, take, it's a paralytic, I'm sorry, take up your mat and walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the whole idea here is that there's sort of two levels of healing. One, the physical healing, which everyone can see and marvel at. But the, but the spiritual healing is in some way the greater one and the more important one, which, which we can't see and which, which we also should marvel at. And I think a lot of you, if you think about diseases today, there's almost like a spiritual component to them. Like can, uh, you think of what cancer does, it's, it's the corruption of sort of healthy cells in your body uh, becoming unhealthy. And, and if you think of that in terms of a spiritual way, you can think of how that would, would represent the, um, the, the, the sort of spiritual descent of a human soul. And I think you can think of most diseases in those terms. So there's really very much a really neat connection between uh, the physical and the spiritual in, in the healing ministry of Jesus. Now, Dr. Benson, I want to start getting to some specific okay. stories, but I thought I'd give you the opportunity to build on anything that's been said before I you know, take it to a new direction. Right. Well, yeah, to, to sort of pick up on some of the themes that we've been talking about, uh, what we see within in the variety of many, many stories uh, in the New Testament of mercy. There are a couple of things that we, if we go back, for example, to Thomas Aquinas, I think we can get a sort of a snapshot of some of the things that are at work here. We begin with the, the Thomistic concept, the idea that we have two types of mercy. There's mercy that is shown by God to man, and then there's mercy that is shown by man to others. The, go back to something else that I said, that, that mercy is always closely connected to justice. So in other words, as, as Aquinas teaches us, you know, God acts mercifully, not by going against his justice, but by doing something more than justice. In other words, he's not contradicting the idea of justice, which is one of the, the things that we hear all the time today, that justice somehow no longer matters. Rather, he is giving us what is due, but gives beyond what is due. And so to leap back to the very first question that started tonight on the incarnation, we're seeing that God is going so far beyond simple justice, which is, of course, traditionally giving what is due to a person. He's going beyond that. And each of the miracles, each of the events in our Lord's life point to the fact that God's love is boundless and God's mercy is an expression of that boundless love. Then we have Christ, of course, telling us that we have to go forth and follow that example. And what does he tell us? He says in the Beatitudes, be merciful as the loving Father is merciful. So there's always a call uh, for us to follow that example, to be merciful and to love as God loves. Yeah, so let's let's talk about some of these stories. I think that one of the more 
compelling stories in the gospel of Mark comes in uh, chapter five, when Jesus heals the demoniac. And uh, Dr. Bunsen, we'll, we'll start with you on this one. So we, we see Jesus actually speaking with the demons in this man. He couldn't be bound any longer. They couldn't tether him down. He'd been beating himself. And it says here, I'm just going to read um, from, from verse nine here. Mark chapter 5, verse 9, and Jesus asked him, talking about the demon, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him eagerly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, send us to the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them leave. It almost sounds like Jesus was having mercy on the demons themselves. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> well, what our Lord is doing is demonstrating his absolute authority over demons, over evil, in every sense of the word. In this case, very specific. Uh, we are legion. So what do we derive from that? But an understanding that the, the demons themselves recognized Christ's authority from the very beginning to the point that they plead with him. But our Lord then to accomplish what he was really setting out to do, which was to free the demoniac of these lepers, uh, of, of these demons, excuse me, of, of this evil, sends them, he gives them leave to do this. So he's not only curing, curing this poor suffering man, he is demonstrating once again his absolute authority over evil, including these demons, by allowing them uh, to leave and go somewhere else. So we're seeing constant demonstrations of Christ's power. But even as he does that, we're seeing his mercy. Dr. Wood, I know you have an agriculture background. Do you have anything to say about this morning first? <laughs> You'll never live that one down. <laughs> I know I won't. I could just imagine them squealing as they plummet it off. The <laughs> but it is violent. Yeah, for real. But in all seriousness, Dr. Wood, I, I kid, I kid. But um, isn't it interesting that, that at the end of this story, the, the man who was the demoniac, who had been possessed with these demons, he wanted to come and follow Jesus. And Jesus told him not to come with him, but to go back to his friends and tell him, and this is a quote, how much the, how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And what do you what do you think that that message means for us today? Hmm. Well, I think uh, we see in there that Jesus is telling him to go and evangelize, and so this is a message for all Christians that once we receive God's mercy, we should go and show that mercy to others and and glorify the Lord in the mercy forgiveness that He has shown us in order to to bring others to Christ. So we're manifesting the great works of God when we do this. And we see this particularly here. I think it's, it may be the only instance in the miracles of Jesus where Jesus says to this one particular person, go and tell people about it. Yeah. I think you, know, you guys might be able to correct me here, but yeah. I think no one, everyone else, Jesus says, say, stay silent. Don't, 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 speak don't tell them about it. That's please. right. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's right. So yeah. Yeah. You can see something very different here. And I believe that um, this is in Gentile territory. It's in the Decapolis, the Ten Cities. And um, Jesus heals this one man. He goes off and presumably tells quite a number of people about Jesus and what he's done. And the next time Jesus comes back to this territory, many people bring the sick to Jesus for healing. So it's as though this man has laid the groundwork for Jesus' um, return to the area. So you can see that the evangelization probably did work by this man. Yeah, and Dr. Brown, uh, oh, go ahead. Real quick for a second, because uh, um, and I, I promise I'll make no reference to your agricultural background any further. Uh, <laughs> to go back to the pigs themselves, our Lord allows the demons to leave this man and to go into what? But swine, who in the whole of the ancient world, and Pete, I know you can address this better yeah. than I can. Not because you have a great fondness for pork, but because of 
an understanding of the, the Semitic culture, pigs were unclean. Pigs were the were untouchable. And our Lord then was sending out demons uh, from this poor man into the animal that was considered absolutely untouchable and unclean. So it's, it's almost, uh, you, you asked earlier if our Lord is being merciful on the demons. I, I would say that it's almost <laughs> a perfect, like a little joke uh, yeah. on demons themselves. Yeah, but, but you know, I've always sort of wondered about this, and, and believe me, I'm not the only person in the tradition has wondered this, that this story is very weird in a way because, for one thing, to get rid of demons, can you kill a demon by putting him in a pig and throwing him off a cliff? I mean, don't the demons just go somewhere else after that? I mean, that's kind of... We kind of left to wonder about that one, and what happens to Betsy about the poor Gentile swineherd who lost his whole yeah. livelihood? I mean, this must have been an enormous uh, blow, and there were even a couple of church fathers who were, who were bothered by that, and, and you know insisted that Jesus made some kind of compensation to them or something like that, so they, so they would not have <laughs> they, would, they would not have had their livelihood completely destroyed because that itself would be would have been a breach of uh, a breach of charity, you know, let alone mercy. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. And the way the story is, is in the, we think of details like that as very weird. This is not the kind of story that would would have been uh, would, would have someone would have invented. Um, that there obviously everyone asks historical questions about the gospel. This is this is one that nobody would have made up a story like this. But yet yeah, this is a this this is a really really fascinating one, just on a lot of different levels. Well, it also seems as though the demons are territorial. Right, because say yeah. uh, there's at the beginning something about um, something about the man rushing out to Jesus and meeting Jesus as though he's trying to protect his territory. Uh, yeah. yeah. So but perhaps the demons going into the swine and plummeting off the precipice um, doesn't necessarily mean that then the demons are free and set loose to roam wherever they like. Right. But they're, they're sort of confined to, the, to this new territory, which is um, the the ocean or the sea. Which is, is is it correct to say that in the Semitic culture, it was believed that that was the realm of evil? Yeah, I I I think so. But I don't know if we want to get too carried away with that because obviously the disciples are also making their living around the sea too. So um, yeah. And, and of course, you know, there's a whole other geographical question about where this actually took place because uh, if you've ever been to Galilee, there actually are no cliffs in Galilee. So it, it appears as though they're they're uh, speaking of cliffs that are in, actually in the Decapolis. Um, there, there's been a lot of discussion on that very point, um, but but it's a, it's an interesting story nevertheless. Yeah. Yeah. And Dr. Brown, I want to move on to a different um, healing miracle, one that, that you have brought up in, in one of your previous answers, and that would be in John chapter 5, the uh, the story of Jesus healing the paralytic. Oh, right. And, um, so this one, Jesus forgives the man's sins first before he gets anywhere close to healing him physically. That's right, yeah. That's right. Uh, th this is this this one too is, is very interesting on a lot of levels. Um, I would say, Annie, in a lot of cases, especially in the fourth gospel and the gospel of John, the characters often really represent, um, you know, they're, they're literary figures on a deeper level for for certain types of people or even institutions. And you notice this man has been sick there for for thirty eight years which, you know, seems like a long time, and why that particular number? Well, it turns out, uh, on, on one tradition, that was exactly the period of time that Israel spent sort of wandering in the desert, you know, and effectively paralyzed by her own rebellion against God in some ways. So, so the man perhaps steps forward as like a figure for for all of Israel. Um, and you're right, Jesus Jesus heals uh, him, this, this paralytic, um, of, of his sin first, and in fact forgives him, um, before he even deals with the the sort of physical paralysis there, um, why the sort of reversal of order that you see uh, in you know different similar stories in the synoptics? I'm not quite sure. That's a really good question. Um, I'd have to think about that one some more. Maybe maybe my co-panelists have some some thoughts on that. Anyone? Yeah. Well, it, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think there's a contrast between chapter 5, the healing here of the paralytic in chapter 5, and the healing of the man born blind in chapter 9. And in chapter 5, 
Jesus says, go and sin no more, lest something right. worse befall you. So it seems as though uh, Jesus is indicating that his, this man's um, physical illness, disability, is an effect of his own personal sin, whereas the episode of the man born blind, there's no such thing. It's, it's more an effect of the sin of Adam. In that man's life. It's an inherited condition versus an acquired condition, in other words. That's right. Yeah. 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 To say that we look around and we see people who are ill and say, oh, you have sinned. Repent <laughs> of your sinfulness. <laughs> like something worse right. before you. Um, we have to be very careful doing that. But yeah, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. we can look to our, our own lives and, and see when we become sick or d disabled in some way, we can see it as a call to conversion and repentance for, for sin. Um, yeah, and that can lead to a, a greater um, union with Christ. Mm -hmm. Dr. Benson, what do you think about the idea of, I mean, going off on, on that, that, that line of thought here, I mean, if, if we find ourselves in a situation where we've acquired a disability or acquired some sickness, the opportunity to then use that in, in the act of redemptive suffering and participating in the Lord's mercy ourselves. Doc, are you there? We can't hear you, Matt. Yeah. Did you mute yourself? starting to say, trying to say unsuccessfully, <laughs> uh, so often in scripture, the idea of disabilities and, and suffering because of direct sinfulness or unworthiness, and our Lord here is healing this man as an act of mercy on the Sabbath, which we need to stress uh, as part of the context of this chapter, right. he's making the, the very vital point of the participation in in our Lord's own suffering, and, and you raise a, I think, a very important point here, Annie, because in culture today, the idea of suffering itself is considered to be absolutely unacceptable. Uh, inconvenience is discouraged, and those who are suffering, almost in the, in, the, in a post-Christian way, are viewed in the same way as. The, the sick and the suffering and the disabled were in the ancient world. Uh, they were unworthy of life. They had somehow failed society. Well, how do we know this? We see this from abortion. We see euthanasia, uh, what Pope Francis calls a throwaway culture, a disposable culture. That those who are disabled somehow lack now the fundamental worthiness and, and the innate dignity of the human person. And for our Lord, what he's, he's making the point here, what has he done? He's done a couple things. On the Sabbath, he has healed this man, but then he follows up and talks to him about sin. He has restored his innate dignity as a human person, and that's something that's very vital, I think, to understand in so many of these stories of, of mercy. The lepers are restored in their dignity, uh, and yeah. that goes to our participation in Christ's suffering. Right. Uh, that we conform ourselves to the cross in the ultimate sense, because through that cross, our dignity it, it is also restored by Christ. Right. Well, what's interesting about the story, too, though, is that the man almost does have sort of a self-pitying attitude. In other words, you know, he's he's there's almost a question. Why have you been sitting here this long um, and you haven't been healed yet? And he's like, well, you know, for me, for me. Uh, every time the water is about to be troubled, someone races down and gets there before me. And so I've been here 38 years like that. And so um, uh, th there is in some way, I think, a, uh, a, a challenge to people who are sort of stuck in a, I wouldn't say stuck in a medical condition, but, but stuck in a, uh, a particular form of life that they, they feel like they can't escape from, right? Because they've, they're just a lost cause, right? You know, they're never going to be the object of, of, of God's mercy, um, there, there's nothing they can do to, uh, to to really alleviate their condition. And so there's there's a certain sort of, uh, I, I guess, a, a sort of take charge in this here, I guess, of really accepting the mercy that's really being offered to you, I think, and, and not, you know, withdrawing to this sort of solipsistic uh, permanent state of, of defeat and self-pity, I think, which is 
which is, I think, maybe another uh, at least part, partial message of the story, too. Yeah. Well, there's one thing, I think that, oh, sorry. No, no, I was just not going to say that question that Jesus gives the man, do you want to be healed? I think we can apply that to our own lives because, as Pete was saying, that we often sort of um, fall back into a sort of comfort mentality of, I, I know who I am, I know I have these weaknesses, I know I have certain physical or, or uh, emotional um, wounds or, or illnesses that I can't get out of, but, you know, I'm comfortable here. And right. maybe I don't really want healing because I, I'm afraid of the unknown. I may have to do more than I am now. Um, and I think we can apply this to our sacramental life when we go to receive um, communion, when we go to the Eucharist. We are before the source of life and the great, great physician, Jesus Christ. And I, I think he's, he's always saying to us, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed of your sinful right. life, of, of all the ailments in your life, of the wounds that people have inflicted upon us or we've inflicted upon ourselves? If you really want to be healed, come to me and I will heal you. And the source of healing is there in, in the Eucharist. Um, and we just have to go there and be open and say yes, and Jesus will heal us. It may take some time, but he wants to heal us completely. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of, um, there's a, is it in Matthew, the other story of the healing of the paralytic where the friends put him down the roof and, um, and put him in front of Jesus and there's like this huge crowd of people. One of the things that, that really stands out to me in that, that story, Dr. Wood, and I was hoping you could reflect on this, is the fact that it says specifically that Jesus saw the faith of his friends and was moved to forgive that man's sins um, and then eventually to, to have him pick up his mat and walk. What do you think of that? What do you make of that? Yeah, I, I believe that's in uh, Mark chapter 2. Um, I think this is really important. It shows the ecclesial nature of Christ's redemption and mercy that uh, we always need faith. Faith always has to be part of, of Jesus' miracles, whether in the individual or at least in the church and the, the community of believers, if you want to put it that way. And you see here that the friends, the four men who, who um, lower the man down through the roof to, to meet Jesus um, shows the type of work that we can do as believers in bringing people to Christ to be healed. So it's the work of evangelization and the great work of mercy too. So you see this particularly in, in the uh, expression of the, the, the spiritual works of mercy that um, we admonish the sinner, um, we counsel the doubtful, etc. And in doing so, we're bringing Christ to that person or that person to Christ. Dr. Bunsen, what is what do you think that story, um, how does that relate to the sacrament of baptism as we know it as Catholics, baptized as infants? Yeah, well, well first, uh, to, to tease this out a little bit further, and by sure. way of so answering your, your question. Go for it. The, our Lord, in much the same way that uh, he, he was healing someone on the Sabbath, uh, here he in his healing in Capernaum, he's irritating uh, the establishment uh -huh. that he sees irritating. Yes. Those who are used to doing things in a certain way, who had a preconceived idea of this, and he, he's speaking to them plainly about authority. So in much the same way as he was on the Sabbath, here he's saying, pick up your, your mat and, and walk. And it's very early in, in Mark's gospel, and yet Christ is already establishing that tension with the, the priestly class with those who have this notion of sin uh, that our Lord is here to clarify for all of us to, to help us understand what sin is and what mercy really is. And one of the, the beautiful things about this story is this whole idea of tearing the roof and, and lowering him in. <laughs> it cuts to the very heart of infant baptism, it seems to me. And it's a great question because... Why do we baptize in this way? We baptize this because we care about this person. This human being we want to have saved. 
and we want to bring them into the family of God. Uh, we want them to have this sacrament, and so we act on their behalf uh, to do this. And in much the same way that this man, without the help of this community, as Christine said, it's, it's a very ecclesial passage, he would have been unable to reach our Lord. So the symbolism is very deep here. Uh, the, the size of the crowd, and yet he still needed the help of those who considered him themselves his friends, his family, to accomplish it. And I think, Dr. Brown, that he makes an interesting point, too, that he's um, that he's really setting up uh, some major contention with the priestly class here that, you know, but, but really drives home the point. Jesus says in the Gospels, I desire mercy. And not sacrifice. Yeah. yeah. He, he says that twice in uh, he says that twice in uh, Matthew's Gospel. Which is interesting. He does a lot of things exactly twice in Matthew's Gospel. And that's that's one of the things I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So yeah, that's that's a that's a quote from Hosea. I don't think it means, by the way, uh, what it's sometimes taken to mean is that God is opposed to sacrifice or all ritual. I mean, after all, God was the one who commanded those rituals. But there's a sense in which I think, and, and you know, even Catholics who obviously have a very very high view of of a liturgy and and uh, uh, ceremonial worship and liturgical worship. Um, there's, there's sometimes there's a sense, you know, that, that you, there is a risk of, of using those to kind of hide behind and, and allowing those things to sort of become ways in which uh, you almost avoid real confrontation with, with God, the Almighty Father, and, you know, the, you know taking on the real, real burden of what he's uh, asking you to do. Um, that sometimes you do get lost. You, you do get lost in, uh, in in the ceremonies as well, and then there probably is something to that. Certainly, something to that in Jesus' world. And there's something 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 in our world to that as well. Yeah, yeah. Now let's let's move on from the healing miracles because there was a lot more that Jesus did under the theme of mercy than uh, That's right. than just miracles. <laughs> you know, you know just I mean, it's miracles. just. Just one of many things that he did. And, um, you know, we see, Dr. Wood, quite a few stories where Jesus shows mercy to people who were considered, I guess you could say, I guess you could call them public sinners. I'm talking about like tax collectors, women who lived in sin, and, and things of that nature. And Jesus really made a point to show his mercy to them. That's right, yeah. So we have the adulterous woman. John chapter 8, or uh, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, Jesus reaches out to save all sinners, not to, he hasn't come to condemn, but to save, and this seems to be in contrast to um, the Pharisees' interpretation of the law, uh, their very strict interpretation of the law, where they seem to just want to condemn, um, and often, often it's because they want to trap Jesus and condemn him. Um, but in particular with the, the woman caught in adultery, we see this great encounter between Jesus and the woman. He's, he's there to transform and call her out of her sinful way. And he doesn't say, okay, your sin's forgiven, on your way, but go and sin no more. So he, he, he becks a total transformation of life. And of course, we know in Catholic theology that he's going to give what's necessary in order to bring that about. We're not on our own. We, uh, we receive the grace of Christ through the encounter with Jesus Christ in order to transform our lives. And we also have the sacraments and everything that the, that the church offers us in order to reform our lives in that way. Well, let's talk a little bit about that story of the woman caught in adultery. That would be in John chapter 8 for anyone following along with, in their Bibles at home. Um, Dr. Brown, I mean, how do you how do you reflect? I mean, it's an incredible message of mercy that's found in this story. Yeah. Well, yeah, in a way, it's almost too incredible, Annie. Uh, one of the controversial <laughs> yeah. story is that um, you, you may know if, if you pick up a, a, a Bible today, uh, including the RSV, the, 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 the NAB, any modern, you'll, you'll find out that most uh, text critics don't think that the story is original. And one of the reasons for that is that this story does not appear in a lot of the ancient manuscripts. And what was 
what's so fascinating about this one is that uh, the church fathers like Augustine and uh, Athanasius were, were aware that this story was not present in a lot of the versions that were floating around. And what their explanation was for the reason that it was, was missing is that probably at the very early stage of transmission, a scribe who was so sort of put off by the reality that, that you could you could forgive a sin as bad as adultery, um, it would be bad to have this in the Bible almost because if it were in the Bible, uh, it, it might lead to too much sexual immorality. In other words, people would get the idea that, um, that, that, you know, it, it's a, it's a free for all now. Um, and you know, you could easily see people, especially in a, in a North African culture around Alexandria, uh, which we know was very, very morally rigorous and ascetic, um, um, believing that way. And so th this story was, was in, in many ways a scandal, not only for, um, Jesus's enemies within the story, but but in some quarters of the early church who had a hard time uh, a, a, a accepting it, and indeed it, it is a story that has an interesting history. Um, you know, we're we're not really sure where the story came from. It does seem to belong in John. I would argue, I'm kind of a majority of minority of scholars on this, that John did actually take it up uh, and put it in in his gospel, although it may originally have come from. Um, from Luke, because it, it does feature a lot of things that Luke talks about, like uh, Pharisees and scribes, like Jesus teaching in the temple, like the Pharisees and scribes testing him. These are not things that you see elsewhere in John, but they do come up several times in Luke. And what's fascinating about the story is there's actually versions, uh, medieval versions of Luke in which this story does appear uh, with, within uh, that that gospel. However, there is some interesting things about the story, too, that that you catch, like Christine had mentioned, that go and sin no more. Um, that was originally something Jesus had said to the paralytic in John 5, and yet he says exactly the same thing to this woman here, and indicating to me that, you know, John knew exactly what he was doing in putting this story here, even though I think he may have found the story from, from originally from a different author. Um, nonetheless, it fits in very well with, with his, uh, his uh, portrayal of Jesus as we have it. It's a fascinating story. Um, now, there's, there's obviously a lot of different things going on in the story here to, to kind of make sense of. For one thing, um, the way I read the story is that the, the, the reason John has it there, by the way, is that John knows basically what we know, find out at the end, that the, the scribes and the Pharisees want to put Jesus to death, but they can't put him to death on their own. They need Roman support for that because the Romans had sort of control of capital punishment. That's why they didn't put Jesus to death on their own. And so basically what they're trying to do here is to make Jesus responsible for their act of stoning the woman so that they ultimately can blame him for causing an insurrection um, against Rome and, and they can have him in effect put to death that way. And so uh, instead of falling into the trap, Jesus in effect springs a trap on them saying, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. In other words, the scribes and the Pharisees are first thinking, ah, well, that's us. We're, of course, without sin. Um, however, then they think, wait, if we were to cast the first stone, then we would be guilty of usurping Roman authority by putting a person to death, and so we better not do that. And besides, if we do that and we blame it on Jesus, all Jesus has to do is go to them and say, well, if you've been actually following my teaching, you realize I do not think that the Pharisees and the scribes are the ones without sin. Uh, I said the one who was without sin cast the first stone. So in other words, in other words, it was really a trap in which they were really trying to test him, and he in effect springs a trap mm -hmm. and, uh, back on them. Not story, but there's a lot of shrewdness as well uh, in, in how Jesus handles this encounter. Yeah, and and Dr. Bunsen, I mean, who of course is the only one there who is without sin who could throw that first stone, but Jesus himself, and yet he doesn't right. throw that stone. <laughs> Oh, you're out of. I can't hear you, Matt. You muted yourself again, Doc. I'm here. There, uh, you go. there is that that old story about uh, uh, his mother uh, sort of rolling a pebble and saying, "Mom, stay out." <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's right. That's right. Like yeah. It. But oh, we're, oh. we're all over the subject of, of moms. I mean, my my late mother once made the observation to a, a, a somewhat uh, judgmental priest that he said he wagged his finger at her and, and said to her god will judge you and, and her only reply was well better him than you <laughs> yeah and the, the 
point being that here we have, uh, we go back to the very, very start of this conversation tonight, Thomas Aquinas, uh, talking about the two kinds of mercy. We have the mercy of God and we have the mercy of man. And the, the mercy of man is very often, uh, let's just say, unreliable. And it is not just, uh, and it is not uh, God's mercy. And if we look at God's mercy, we see Jesus at work here. Uh, we see that, that the key phrase here is he tells her, go forth and sin no more. So instead of judging, condemning, and killing, our Lord is healing and releasing. And this life was transformed because of this encounter with Christ's mercy knowing full well that everyone around her uh, wanted to kill her, uh, according to what? To the ancient law, to the old law. Christ is the new law. And he brings with him a fuller understanding of mercy uh, that does not, at the same time, do an injustice to justice. Mm. That's a beautiful thought. Um... I wanted to, to move on to another sinful woman, the the doctor <laughs> Oh thank you. We're we're gonna talk about we're, we're always gonna talk about realize. Wow, I just <laughs> You're it's right. Not that I didn't even realize how that uh, that was a that was an interesting thing that I speaking of sinful women, let's talk to Dr. Wood here. No. <laughs> I meant. Um, I was. I was thinking about um, the other story. I was hoping you could reflect on the other story of the, the sinful woman who weeps on the feet of Jesus. Right. Um, I believe that's Luke chapter seven. Yeah. Oh, Luke chapter seven. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So she's in um, Simon the Pharisee's house. Jesus goes there to dine with him, and this woman comes in and washes Jesus' feet with her tears and wipes them with her hair, and Jesus forgives her sins through this. And, and uh, Simon is is scandalized by this this event, and how can, how can he uh, forgive sins? How can Jesus forgive sins? And so Jesus gives the parable about the two debtors, one who is who owes a debt of... Um, what is it, 50 denarii versus um, the other one who owes a debt of 500. So you can see a huge contrast between the two debts. One denarii is about what, uh, a labourer's daily wage. So it's about a, a month and a bit of a wage that this person owes versus a year and a half. So both of them are, are quite big um, debts but one far more than the other and Jesus asked the question in the end who who would be the most grateful um, and and of course it's the one whose whose greater debt was forgiven and so that's that's the woman her, her she's she's known as the sinner and um, she is most grateful to Jesus for, for forgiving her sins because um, it's a debt that she could not repay and I think this is this is a really important passage for us because it helps it sheds light upon what sin is that it's often considered to be a debt that we owe and a, a debt that we cannot pay back. So you see this sort of it's almost like a mercantile um, a image for sin, and it's Jesus within Catholic tradition. Of course, Jesus is the one who comes to pay the debt that we couldn't pay. Um, and I guess one question comes up, who does he pay it to? Some people <laughs> think that he pays it to Satan, <laughs> but, but you never see that in Scripture. Yeah, the debt is never never uh, spoken of as being paid to Satan. It's just a debt that's paid, and presumably it's sort of paid to God the Father, whose honour has been taken away through man's sin. So... Um, yeah, so in the end, um, Jesus says to the woman, uh, where is it? You guys might be able to help me. Um, that Luke 7, 38, yeah, let's see. Yeah, 38, is it? Yeah, let's uh, see. 7. 
Yeah, 47. Therefore, I tell you, her sins are many. Uh, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. I believe that a better translation of that is that her sins, which are many, are forgiven, and therefore she has loved much. So it, you see the priority of grace in this event, that because her sins are forgiven, because God has shown grace and mercy to the woman, now she is able to love abundantly. So it's not because she's loved much that she is forgiven her sin. That would be more of a Pelagian sort of approach to the to forgiveness. But rather, Christ is the one who takes the initiative to forgive sin and through the reception of that forgiveness and that grace and that healing, now the woman is restored to fullness of life, you could say, and because of that, now she can love abundantly and return that love to Christ and to share it with others. Dr. Boston? Yeah, there's a key word that, that sort of runs through this whole passage, especially as it relates particularly to this woman, and that word is gratitude. Yeah. And how do we respond to Christ's mercy? In this case, uh, it is with the immense gratitude of this woman. She, as, as this story relates, as this passage relates, she came to him in humility uh, and in faith and in trust and she sees all the things that one recognition of someone who's greater than she, but someone also who can bring to her the mercy that she seeks in humility. She went into that room fully anticipating that perhaps she might have been ejected, uh, that she might have been dragged away uh, because she is a, a known and horrible sinner. And yet here was our Lord giving her his mercy and her response is gratitude and our lord acknowledges that yeah and dr brown can't we see ourselves all of us see ourselves in this woman that we need to approach the feet of the lord and and seek out that forgiveness yes absolutely in fact annie this is usually the point at which i go on my usual rant about uh, debt and, and debt being a metaphor for sin and sure. us living in a society in which there's a lot of borrowing and a lot of lending yeah. and tons and tons of indebtedness. But this is one of, of many examples in the New Testament you can point to in which uh, not only is debt a, a metaphor for sin, but there is a, of an undercurrent in the Bible that is uh, hostile to the idea of a lot of indebtedness. Um, and that really goes back to a tradition of the Old Testament where you know, people had a tendency in the ancient world to fall into debt. And, you know, one of the reasons that the tradition of the Jubilee was instituted, where God would command Israel to forgive all debts, you know, every 50 years or so, was because God had already redeemed Israel once and given her the land. And so he wasn't about to see the people allow their land to, to go back to creditors. And so, um, you know, it's not popular to say this, but, uh, but you know, we, we are living in a very... Uh, weird time in which, you know, finance is a huge part of our lives. Everyone has to borrow money to do anything. And um, I, I don't mean to suggest that, that you know, uh, sin is, is you know, or, or that it, financial indebtedness is worse than sin, but there is a sense in which, you know, the, the, the Bible seems to kind of treat them both as one, a metaphor for the other. And, you know, we speak of Jesus ransoming. That, uh, that was, I think, what Christine referenced earlier, where Jesus, in effect, pays a debt he doesn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. Um, this is true, um, and, and it's, you know, also why that we should be a little bit careful um, about not only falling into sin, but falling into a pattern where we owe people a ton of money because that, you know, I'm not suggesting that's worse than slavery to sin, but there's, there's a form of slavery in that that's, it's very real and is not something that the New Testament ignores, even if uh, you don't hear a lot from the pulpit on this. And so um, I, I don't mean to go on a digression there a little bit, but, but I, I bring it up more and more and stuff because I think that uh, you, you hear evangelicals talking about this, which I think is great. There are, there's a lot of evangelical ministries that deal with financial management. And I, I think that uh, the Catholic Church needs to, uh, to, to kind of catch up with that as well, because that is a a part of our understanding of the gospel too. I mean, after all, uh, you know, until modern times, the church did what was 
not too keen on the idea of, of lots of borrowing and lots of lending. Um, and, and so uh, we need to remember that. I, I, again, I don't want to filibuster here again, but it's, <laughs> so, yeah. Sure. No, but, um, but you do bring up a, a good point here, too, that, I mean, that this idea of, of having a debt that needs to be paid um, being a metaphor that Jesus uses constantly. And in that um, vein, uh, Becky writes a question. She asks, do any of you see mercy in the wages for the workers arriving late to the vineyard? Uh, does anyone want to does anyone want to pick up on that question? That's a good Mark question. Carson? Yeah, what do you think, Mark Matt? Carson, are you muted? <laughs> Having some issues with my thing. My apologies to her, oh, no, everybody participating. Uh, yeah, I, I do, actually, in, in the sense that, um, and, and not to be the, the person who keeps going to mystic on all of us tonight, but <laughs> uh, we have... Okay. In, in, in Thomas Aquinas, we have this idea of justice, of what is just and, and what is right. It's tinged, of course, that marriage of justice and mercy. And at first blush, it would seem that uh, the, these wages that are owed to these laborers, uh, it, it seems unjust in our current way of understanding things that they, they should be paid. But yet, here they were. They were arriving to work. They were arriving go to this last story, much like this woman, uh, they thought here they could find what they were seeking. Uh, and they're not going to be punished for being late. Uh, in fact, they're being rewarded instead for being there at all. Yeah. And our Lord, I think, understands better than uh, we ever will, uh, that for those who come to him humbly, uh, asking for not demanding their wages, but to work, uh, to do their part in the vineyard. Uh, that why is why are they going to be penalized? Our Lord simply wants them there. I think that's a great way of looking at it, um, Doctor Wood. I want to talk about the the Our Father um, as well because we're we're getting toward the end of our our discussions here. And um, of course, the Our Father, the prayer that, that Jesus taught us, what do we learn about mercy in that prayer? Yeah, well, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's that's a major challenge, isn't it? Often we just focus <laughs> on the first part of that, that line. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but if we, I, I remember one priest uh, in a confession I went to, um, I confessed the inability to um, to forgive someone for the, uh, I guess, the, the offence caused by this person. And it had been going on for some time and the priest just said to me, do you pray the Our Father? I thought, gosh, it's a random question. Of course I do. <laughs> I didn't know where it was going. But anyway, he said, what about that line? Do you have trouble praying that line? And immediately I realized, oh, boy, I haven't really thought about that line at all. Um, but that was enough for me to ask God for the grace to forgive this person because I knew that I couldn't do it myself. And it's amazing how God does give you that grace. But it's also, you also have to realize that uh, with fallen human nature, we have a tendency to keep flipping back to the old habitual ways. And so we need to root that out of our life, especially if it's a very inbuilt habit, which becomes a vice. And so we need God's healing grace to, to really root that vice out. Um, so you also see in that, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or um, what is it in, in the Sermon on the Mount? Uh, sh basically, show mercy according to the to the degree that you've received mercy. And so, um, this is if we want to receive God's mercy in abundance. In a sense, we need to show that to others. And in doing so, we receive God's mercy in abundance. And so God's mercy is what flows through us out to others. God's love flows through us out to others. If we sort of put a stop, um, a, a buffer in there, 
to stop it flowing out to others if we're stingy in our love and our mercy, forgiveness towards others, then we're unable to receive God's mercy. That's that's the paradox. God's mercy has to keep flowing out through us to others. Otherwise, we destroy the mercy and grace that we've received. So as Father Robert Barron says so beautifully, um, we must give away God's grace in order to receive it. We only have it if we give it away, and that's a great bar- paradox of God's God's love and mercy, His forgiveness and mercy. And I mean, uh, how often, Dr. Bunsen, does Jesus say, you know, you will be measured by the measure which you give out, or I think I just botched that quote, but I think you know what I'm talking about, or yeah. love one another as I have loved you. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, that's the thing. We're, we are called, first and foremost, to love one another uh, and to display mercy to one another. Uh, how often do we injure each other, uh, intentionally or unintentionally? And our Lord is reminding us that we must be instruments of his mercy, of his loving mercy, because when we give of ourselves in mercy, we are making it possible for others to encounter him. I always go back to Pope Francis's uh, motto. You know, he said, Ando atque abigenda, with mercy chosen, you know, that our Lord saw Matthew, as he said, with the eyes of mercy and called him. And that's what he's doing for all of us. Uh, that when we live mercy in our lives, uh, we are trying slowly, hopefully getting better every day to live Christ. And when we live Christ, others see him through us, uh, which is why we're here, to help them have that encounter. Yeah. Dr. Brown, how do, how do we see a, a theology of mercy coming out in something like the Our Father? Well, I, I think uh, to expand on what Dr. Wood said just a minute ago, um, forgive us our sins as we forgive others. It really brings out that the idea of that, that Maybe to put it a little bit differently, that the idea of mercy is not just, you know, vertical where it it comes down from heaven to us, but it's also horizontal, that it comes down from heaven to us and then sort of flows out through us horizontally. There's also a very strong social dimension to it as well, and and we might even say an ecclesial dimension. Um, The church has always emphasized this uh, as well. I don't think you can squeeze all of this out of the Our Father, but nevertheless... Uh, the idea that, that when you commit sin, um, it's not simply necessary, it's not enough to be reconciled to God. You also have to be reconciled to the church because uh, the church is really God's instrument for forgiveness. Um, it's, in effect, continuation of Christ's presence here on earth. And that's why the, the, the normal ministry of forgiveness is, is offered through the, the, the sacraments and, and the Holy Spirit of the church. Um, it's not to say God can't forgive you other ways, but, but the normal way of receiving forgiveness is 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 through uh, his his chosen instrument. Um, Hilda asks, and I'll I'll give this to you, Doctor Brown. Is correction a form of mercy? Fraternal correction, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when, when Doctor Bunsen makes a mistake, I, I'm I'm very happy to uh, to set him straight. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> And, and all? Yeah. <laughs> but, yes, most definitely. If it's done in charity, of course. Event, I should point out. Yes. <laughs> I don't think but, I uh, ever have to do Dr. Bunsen, but go on, Dr. Brown. <laughs> yes, so most definitely I think so. Yeah, fraternal correction is one of the uh, the things in which the, the, the St. Paul and, and some of the Catholic epistles uh, counsels to do. Of course, done... Um, in a spirit of charity and not in a spirit of, uh, of, of lording over um, our superiority to the person being corrected. Um, it's a very difficult thing to correct as well, um, uh, particularly if the person is in a higher status uh, than, than you are. Now, I'm sure it was very, very difficult for St. Catherine of Siena to correct the Pope um, yes. when, when he had decided to move to Avignon, but, you know, sometimes you, you, you have to do it. There is a level for general correction, but it, uh, there is a danger, though, having said that, in people who are really, really eager to be the fraternal corrector. Um, yes. Generally speaking, the best people to get fraternal correction are the ones who, who least want to do it. 
Um, and so the, the people who are most eager to do it are probably not the ones who should be doing it as much. Right. Well, if you're going to get the splinter out of someone else's eye, Dr. Wood, you need to uh, get the, the log out of yours, right? Is that, that's what Jesus said, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Dr. Bunsen admonished the sinner is a, cor- or, uh, a spiritual work of mercy. Uh, it is. I mean, which uh, ultimately is uh, more merciful to allow someone uh, to continue to walk a path that is going to lead them right off of a cliff uh, or to, in a way that's very charitable, perhaps try to steer them in a different direction. And one of the aspects of the theology of accompaniment here so much about today is, yes, we, we do have to accompany everyone. Uh, but part of that accompaniment is making sure that uh, the road they're on uh, actually leads somewhere, uh, that leads somewhere that they, in the end, want to be. Uh, to apply authentic mercy is to have the courage, uh, in, especially in today's environment, to be unpopular. Uh, and as long as we do it with charity and, and with kindness, with patience, uh, in the end, I think people will see First, the motive of why you were doing this, but also the rightness of your argument. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm really sad to say that, that this is all the time that we have for um, our questions tonight. We didn't even get to the crucifixion. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking maybe we could do an entire webinar on the crucifixion and the resurrection alone. So maybe we should plan for that. Just a thought. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but keep it in mind. That that I think would be a really fun um, segment for, for me to moderate because this is all about me and what what kind of. <laughs> I have. Um, but uh, nonetheless, Dr. Brown, I understand that there's another giveaway for those who, who have um, stayed with us through this through this hour and about 15 minutes or so. So what yes. uh, what are we giving away tonight? Yes. Well, we we have uh, several several giveaways. I think uh, uh, three lucky. Uh, viewers are going to get more CDU swag. Uh, the yes. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It will be a surprise, but it will come to you <laughs> in the mail, uh, courtesy of, of CDU. And we're also going to offer three other lucky viewers uh, a free course to take at CDU, which is normally a, well, depending on what course it is, it could be as much as $165 value. Um, so we're, we're going to uh, to give that away for, for for free to three lucky viewers. So um, maybe uh, uh, Jordan, I think, who is back behind stage somewhere, could, could pick the uh, the three winners at random, uh, and that would be fantastic. Those yeah. If um, anybody anybody here listening right now that wants to be in contention for that, in the question bar, I want you to type, "I want CDU." <laughs> I want CDU, and uh, and then as um, as Dr. Brown said, uh, the U Catholic folks will uh, pick your names at random. I am now seeing all kinds of I want CDUs <laughs> inundating my question box. That's awesome, um, and and good luck with that. Um, and we'll look forward to doing another one of these webinars. Right? Do I have it yes, all committed? Awesome. Oh, awesome. So, so thank you, Dr. Maybe Brown. Have a better month so, yes. Fantastic. Awesome. So, uh, stay connected to uh, CDU. I thought we could end with, um, with an Our Father, since we were just discussing it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trust against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in for this special webinar. Uh, my name, again, is Anna Mitchell. I'll talk to you bright and early on the Sunrise Morning Show. In fact, Dr. Matthew Munson will be on the show talking about Thomas Aquinas' bestie, St. Bonaventure, for his feast day. So you definitely want to tune in to that, check uh, check out where your local Catholic radio station is, or you can tune in through sunrisemorningshow.com. So I look forward to talking to you tomorrow morning. Thanks again. God bless. Bye-bye.